Well, I want to welcome you if you're online or at Webster or at Greece or here in Aronikoi. We're glad you're here. And we're going to be today in Ephesians chapter 1. If you want to turn there in one of our Bibles, we're going to be on page 946 here in a little bit. Um, but we are in the second week, as you saw on the title package. We're in the second week of a series. It's called Fighting FOMO. And FOMO is what? FOMO is the fear of missing out. And Jonathan said last week, and said it really well, FOMO is an ancient problem with a powerful modern trigger. And that trigger is social media. And I saw some stats this week tied to the number of people who are on social media. And it wasn't surprising to me on the younger side, you know, 90 plus percent, well beyond 90 plus percent of those who are younger are on social media. But one stat that surprised me was those who are 65 or over. And did you know that in that demographic, more than 50% of those 65 or over are on Facebook? And that, that was kind of a, a surprise. And I thought, wow, this is really true. What Jonathan said is true. It is an ancient problem, but there is a powerful modern trigger. And that trigger is tied to we all get to see each other and we all get to compare. One of the things he talked about is how we struggle with contentment. And his statement was, we will never be content when we compare our behind-the-scenes footage to everyone else's highlight reel. We'll never be content when we compare our behind-the-scenes footage to everyone else's highlight reel. And that's what we see on social media, is we see everyone else's highlight reel. Well, today, we're not going to talk about contentment. We're going to actually talk about authenticity and the lack of authenticity in what we see on social media and in what we observe. And as a result of that, this is almost like, this is the source of Jonathan's talk last week. Our struggle with contentment comes because of this lack of authenticity that's out there. And you say, really? There's a lack of authenticity online? Like there's things online, right, that, that aren't true? Well, I went looking. I went looking. And uh, I have a, a couple of images here that I uh, will show you uh, that I, I, they'll just kind of help you to understand where we're coming from. Um, as we do, I, I want to show you, this is what we call a, a uh, crocoduck, okay? Crocoduck. Isn't that kind of nice? And then here's another one, the biggest beak that you ever did see. Yeah, pretty good. And then here's a third one online. <laughs> How's that for a lack of authenticity, right? How's that for a lack of authenticity? I'm telling you, I've seen these guys without shirts. It doesn't look anything like that. <laughs> Nothing like that. Uh, there is a lack of authenticity. So what you see is a highlight reel. What I see is a highlight reel. When I'm watching online, when you're watching online, we're seeing something that just, you know, it's a highlight reel of people's lives. And it's going on out there. In fact, there was a recent ABC News uh, report where they were talking about what's happening with regards to what you're seeing and what I'm seeing when we're watching online. Check this out. Imagine changing your entire selfie image with the click of a button. Want to look slimmer, prettier, even younger? 90% of teens today say they've posted selfies online where perfection is just a filter away. But some are taking the quest to even bigger extremes, striving to look airbrushed in real life. Here's ABC's Cecilia Vega. This is how Americans are spending their time, taking pictures of themselves all day, every day. And like millions of people, Triana Levy, thank you, loves taking selfies. We just took some of these selfies outside and they're super cute. But she doesn't always love the result. I feeling like I look a little pale in these pictures. So to get the perfect picture, she just uses an iPhone app. So the filter that I like to use is actually just natural. And it's a really subtle difference, and it just kind of smooths out your face. I love to try on new looks. The Perfect 365 app lets you airbrush your selfie, one tap to try hot new styles, and become an instant cover girl. The art of the selfie has created a whole industry of smartphone apps to help you look your best. Think you look too fat? Try skinny pics, dull skin or blemishes, Facetune can clear that right up. Your social media presence is just as important as your real life presence. Your social media presence is just as important as your real life presence. You know, you think you look a little fat? Skinny pics, we'll take care of you. Got a blemish? We can handle that. Want to look like a cover girl? We can make that happen. Statement there, perfection is just a filter away. You guys have probably experienced this, right? You, you have somebody that you have seen online, you've interacted with online, you've seen pictures of them online, and then you meet them in person, 
Yeah, you've been there, right? I mean, it just looks a little different. And that's all the result of what's happening out there. So when we look at what we see on our phones every day, just realize that there's this undercurrent that other people look good, so I feel like i got to look good. And then the better they look, then the better I feel like I've got to look. It's almost like i got to pick the perfect picture, and then i got to get the perfect caption for that picture, and then i got to get the right hashtag. It's got to be clever, but not too clever. I got to look like I'm trying, but I'm not trying too hard. And then I send it out there, and I hope people like it. I hope people comment on it. I hope people look at it. I hope it gains some traction online. And that's the danger in all this. And, and it's interesting. It, it, it begins to mess with us. It, they're beginning to do studies on what happens when we're sending our posts out, and people begin to like them. And it's interesting what they're finding. Neuroscientists have found that seeing all those likes on social media posts may be especially intoxicating. In the first study to scan teenagers' brains while they use social media, scientists from UCLA's Brain Mapping Center found that a certain part of the brain associated with rewards hums with activity whenever teens see one of their photos earning a lot of likes. What's interesting about this study is as they map our brains, this area of our brains is the exact same area of our brains that hums with activity when we're intoxicated with alcohol or with drugs or with pornography or with gambling. Same part of our brain. It's intoxicating for us. And it is something that, you know, we want likes. We like likes. We want to be liked. What's, what's interesting is this problem of our desire to have an image that everyone's you know, excited about, is not something new. It's been going on for thousands of years. Jesus talked about it in Matthew chapter 6 and says, just be careful about being too worried about your image. This is what Jesus had to say in Matthew 6. He says, be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. When you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets as the hypocrites do. And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on street corners to be seen by others. And when you fast, do not look somber as the hypocrites do, for they disfigure their faces to show others that they are fasting. You see, this problem, this problem that we struggle with, this image management, this putting a good face out, this is not a social media problem. This is a human problem. We've been struggling with this for thousands of years. It's called pride, right? I want to look good. You want to look good. I want friends. I want to be liked. I want love. Like, I want people to like me. And as often happens when I begin to, you know, think through a talk and begin to put something together, God gives me personal opportunities to see myself up close and personal tied to a given talk. And that happened here recently. Uh, my daughter's seven. Her name's Elise. And she was looking at my phone. She pulled out my phone, and she began to play with my phone. And she came across this image here on my phone. And you know what it's like, seven-year-old. She begins to ask questions. You know, why, 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 right, kids? And she says, Dad, why are all these on your phone? And I said, oh, Elise, yeah, um, those are some video clips that I put together. I wanted to send one to the Whitings. See, the Whitings are going to be leaving, and so we were doing these selfie video clips. And so Daddy wanted to send one to them just to say, you know, thanks for all you mean to us. You've done an amazing job. We've loved you here at Northridge. And so I wanted to send them a video clip. And so that's what those are. And she said, well, did you send all of them to them? <laughs> no, I didn't. How many did you send, Dad? I sent one. That's right. I sent one. Well, then why are there all of these? So then I began to explain. I said, well, you see, Elise, when you look at these, I mean, these down here, look, dad had the phone too close to his face when he did these. And so as a result of that, you can see dad's head looks long and skinny. It looks like a watermelon. <laughs> see, that's not how daddy really looks. <laughs> So we can't use that one. And, and you see these, Elise, down here, you see, uh, Daddy had the phone too low, and he was shooting from down low. You can look right up Daddy's nose. <laughs> and that wouldn't be good, so we can't use those. And these up here, Daddy's not even smiling. I mean, the Whitings didn't die. <laughs> they just moved to Houston, so I can't use those. And the more I talked, and the more she asked questions, the worse I began to feel. 
Because the truth was, I didn't shoot all these video clips for the Whitings. I shot all these video clips for me. Because I was concerned about my image. And I was concerned about how it would look. And I was concerned. And so, do another one, do another one, do another one, do another one. And she'd outed me. And that is so easy. It's so easy for me to be all concerned about friends, concerned about likes, and concerned about love. And wanting people to appreciate me. It's almost like elementary school all over again, right? I'm standing against a wall and we're going to play kickball and they're picking teams and I'm raising my hand. I'm going, pick me, pick me, pick me. I want people to like me and you do too. That's not all bad, but it can get out of balance. There was a study that was done by the American University at Washington and they found a correlation between body image issues and social media. According to researchers, seeing countless images online leaves one psychologically dissatisfied with our own size and shape. Surprise, surprise, right? Even if they're physically fit, this leads to poor body image and possibly even eating disorders. 80% of women in the U.S. are dissatisfied with their appearance. And according to Teen Magazine, 50 to 70% of normal weight girls think they're overweight. Well, this shouldn't be a surprise to us, right? Think about it. A couple hundred years ago, who did we have to compare ourselves with? If I lived a couple hundred years ago, you lived a couple hundred years ago, I could compare myself with my family, right? Maybe the people at church, I could compare myself with them. Maybe school, if I went to a one-room schoolhouse. Maybe people in the town that we lived in or the village. But what is it? You know, a couple hundred people, that's all I compared myself with. Well, if we live today in light of social media, how many people can you compare yourself with? Like a billion, right? I mean, it's all over the world. I mean, we can compare ourselves with everyone, and therefore we struggle. Google tells us that as a group, we post 93 million selfies every day. Google also tells us that we check our phones over 100 billion times every day. 93 million selfies. There's some selfie traps out there that tied to this whole lack of authenticity. And maybe you've seen some of these, maybe you can relate to some of these, but there is a pressure on me to, you know, kind of cast myself in the best light possible. And that begins to affect my relationships with other people. Uh, Maybe you have observed these. This this, uh, first one here is the (laughs) get in shape shape selfie, right? You know, it's the, the smoothie, the fruit smoothie selfie. And what it's saying is, I'm getting in shape. When the truth sometimes is, I've just eaten a large bowl of popcorn, some chips, and I'm eating my favorite candy bar, right? (laughs) And so I need to get in shape because this is me. There's the great mom selfie, right? Maybe you've seen this. You know, my my, my kids are doing great. I look great. We're having a great time. I mean, this is just, things are going great in my family. When the truth is, you know, oftentimes things aren't necessarily going so great, and they don't look so great. So don't post this one, just post the other. It's dad's too, right? The great dad selfie. Look at, you know, we're in the kitchen, we're doing some baking, we got our outfits on, you know, things are going great. When really, as dad, I feel overworked. And even when I'm with my kids, I don't know that I really am with my kids. How about the great date selfie? The perfect date selfie. We are infatuated with each other. We can't keep our eyes off each other. We're having a great night together tonight. When sometimes the truth is I'm more infatuated with my phone when I'm out with my spouse than I am with my spouse. And then finally, the spiritual guy or spiritual girl selfie. Got my Bible, got my journal, got my coffee, got my fruit. (laughs) And I'm connecting with God in big, big ways today. When sometimes reality is I really haven't connected with God in a while. I haven't really read my Bible. I haven't really spent time in prayer. And I've got doubts. I'm struggling. The truth is, the more we show others the me we want them to see, the more difficult it becomes to be authentic. The more we show others the me we want them to see, the more difficult it becomes to be authentic. It starts to mess with our authenticity. And what happens is we start to show this side and people can't relate to us. They look at us and go, no, he's too perfect. She's too perfect. No, I could never relate there. And we actually push people away as opposed to pull them in. We want to look good, but we make it harder for our relationships. And we wake up one day and we find ourselves 
living for likes while longing for love. We're living for likes on social media, but we're longing for love. We find ourselves noticed by many, but known by almost no one. We find ourselves with a quest to be noticed. We're not truly ever known. And it's all because we've been fed this line and we see this stuff happening out there and we feel like we've got to measure up. We've got to look good enough. We've got to post well. Friedrich Buchner has said, what we hunger for perhaps more than anything else is to be known in our full humanness. And yet that is often just what we also fear more than anything else. It's important to tell at least from time to time the secret of who we truly and fully are. You guys have seen this. Sometimes it happens online, right? I mean, sometimes people do this. It's that, you know, giant pile of laundry, and it's like, you know, my task for today. Or it's that pile of dishes in the sink. Or it's the kids are a wreck. They're a mess. And, and people put them online. Actually, when that happens, I think it helps you to connect so much better because you're relatable, and people are looking for relation. That's what they're looking for. We can wake up and find ourselves impressing others with our strengths but not connecting with them through our weaknesses. We're trapped into showing who we want people to see instead of who we really are. You see, weaknesses, showing our weaknesses helps us to connect. It just does. It's being real. People want real. People want authentic. I heard a researcher recently talking about the growth of Snapchat. And one of the things they said, Snapchat is a social medium, and it has grown far faster than Instagram, than Facebook, or than Twitter. And they were saying, why is it? Why has Snapchat taken off? Why has it have all of these people connecting on that medium? And what they were saying was they, they feel like it's because it's authentic, because it's real. It's harder to fake it on Snapchat. It just is. And they feel like that's part of the reason it's grown so fast. See, people are looking for authentic. They're looking for real. See, at my house, we have some, we have some goats, we have like a little barn and some goats down at the bottom of the hill. And, and one of the things about the goats, um, I have a 10th grade daughter, Olivia, and she likes to take pictures. So she basically started a, an Instagram page for my goats. And so they have a, a, an Instagram page, my goats do. And, and I'm kind of bitter about their, their page, and I'll just, I'll just show you here why I'm a little bitter. So this is my goats page, okay? Uh, my goats have 14,500 followers on their page, Okay. When my goats post, they have 1,624 likes on their post, and they get 126 comments on their page. It is. It is. In fact, I looked it up today uh, just to see what it's at. It's now 14,800 followers that my goats have. And uh, yeah, so crazy, right? Crazy. Why is that? Why, Why do my goats do so well? I think part of the reason they do so well is because they're authentic, right? I mean, you can't fake that, right? You, how do goats fake that? Like this guy here, he's not faking it. That's just who he is. <laughs> this is real. People love real. And yet when it comes to my post, I'm afraid of real. I don't want to show real. I want to show you what everybody else is showing because I don't want to look bad. You see, your unfiltered selfie can be criticized. It can be ignored and it can be unfollowed. And I don't want to be criticized. I don't want to be ignored. And I don't want to be unfollowed. And neither do you. Because it hurts. It's hard. And I fear people, frankly. I fear people. I want people to like me. And therefore, I'm scared to share the way it really is. Well, how do we know if we're struggling with authenticity? How do you know if that's your struggle, if you struggle that way? I have a couple questions for you to help on that front. Uh, The first one is, are you focused more on who's following you than you are focused on following God? You're more focused on who's following you than you are focused on following God. When you wake up in the morning, what, what really concerns you? What really concerns me? When I wake up in the morning, am I, am I thinking about my posts? Am I thinking about my God? What's the first thought that comes to my mind? Second question, are you obsessing more about what others think about you than you are about what God thinks about you? Obsessing more about what others think about you than you are about what God thinks about you. You see, it's so easy for me to be concerned with likes, be concerned with love, and be concerned with friends. And wanting friends, wanting people to like me, wanting people to friend me, wanting people... 
to love me and, and click on my post. And God would say, if I'm struggling with authenticity and if that is getting out of balance and that's becoming more important, he says, I've got some answers for you. I've got some answers for your authenticity struggles. And I believe those answers begin with just one word and that word is remember. If God was here today, he'd say remember. I want you to remember. When you get that concerned about what others think, I want you to remember what it is that I have done for you and remember how it is that I feel about you. So in Ephesians chapter 1, I want to just read through some statements about what God thinks about you and what he thinks about me. And just think of this in light of friends and in light of likes and in light of love. What does God think about you? What has he done for you? Speaking here of God. It says, For he, God, chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ. In him we have redemption through his blood and forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us. For we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so that we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. We are God's children. Now, if we are children, we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in his suffering in order that we may also share in his glory. You see, when God looks at your unfiltered selfie, when he looks at my unfiltered selfie, what is it that he sees? He sees these seven things. He sees somebody who's chosen. He sees somebody who's redeemed. He sees somebody who's forgiven. He sees somebody who's rich. He sees somebody who's his masterpiece. He sees someone who's his child. He sees someone who's his heir. That's who he sees when he looks at your unfiltered selfie and mine. Well, the hard part in all of this is I forget that, right? I don't remember that. I'm more concerned about what you guys think about me. I'm more concerned about what the social media community thinks about me. And I forget all he's done for me and what he thinks about me. It's almost like the comparison of fear versus love. You say, how so? Fear versus love. You see, I fear other people. We fear other people. And as a result of that, fear drives us to pursue the fickle favor of friends. I want friends. And my friends don't stick with me all the time, but I want friends and I want them. I want their approval. Whereas on the other side, you've got God and his love. God pursues us. Love drives God to pursue his precious prize of sons and daughter, his family. I'm all about friends. God's all about family. And the amazing thing is, this is the creator of the universe. Think about that. The creator of the universe. Bigger than anything you can imagine. More important than anything you can imagine. He loves you. He loves me. He considers you his kid. He considers me his kid. Why, I don't know, but he does. That's love. That's love. And I have to keep pushing myself back to the side when I run over here. Well, what do I do if I forget my identity? If this is my identity, I have a tendency to forget it and lose sight of it and go back over there. What do I do? How, how can I? What are some solutions? What are some things that we can all do to not forget our identity? What, what are those solutions? The first solution is work on following God closer. Work on following closer. And that's following God. Are you focused more on who's following you than you are focused on following God? Work on following closer. I like to think of this two ways for me. It's slow down and quiet down. Slow down and quiet down. You see, the scripture says God speaks in a still small voice. And you know, there's power in solitude. There's power in just connecting with him and just slow down and quiet down. And this is so much more difficult today in light of technology than it's ever been before. But it is powerful, and I need it in my life, and you need it in your life as well. When I lose sight, when I'm struggling, and I've forgotten my identity, I need every day to slow down and quiet down and find that quiet place where I can hear that still small voice. The second thing, if I struggle to forget my identity, is study God's thoughts. Um, are you obsessed more about what others think about you than about what God thinks about you? Then you got to study God's thoughts. How do you do that? Uh, they can work all different ways. It could be, you know, reading your Bible. It could be scripture memory. It could be listening to sermons. It could be worship tracks or songs that you listen to. 
I don't know what works for you, but figure out your know, podcasts or blog posts, but find ways to study God's thoughts. Be reminded of God's thoughts. Every day, be reminded of God's thoughts. And then the third way, if you struggle to forget your identity, is check in with God more often than you check on what others are saying about you. So maybe it's your phone. Maybe that's where you check in on what others are saying. Maybe you say, okay, for this week, I'm just going to check in with God as often as I check in with everybody else. And so every time I go to my phone to check posts, I'm going to make it an opportunity just to say thanks to God for something. Whatever. Life, you know, family, job, food, you know, his provision. What is it? Something. You know, the sunshine. What is it that I'm going to thank God for? Because I'm going to connect with God and I'm going to make it a point to connect with God more often than I connect with everyone else as a reminder of how important this is. We see it's so easy for all of us to forget our identity and lose sight of our identity. And Tim Keller had a quote recently that he just talked about the power of remembering the gospel and all this. He says, through the gospel, we have come to base our identity not on what we've achieved, but on what has been achieved for us in Christ. You see, it's the gospel. I've got to remember the gospel. You've got to remember the gospel. Surprise, surprise, it goes right back to the gospel in remembering all that's been done for us in light of it. Well, sometimes I need a little more of a reminder than just a, oh yeah, um, as I go through this week, I've got to slow down and quiet down. And as I go through this week, I need to you know, think more of God's thoughts, spend more time reading. Um, sometimes it helps me to have a, a more tangible takeaway. And so uh, what we want to give you today on your way out to help you to remember these things is just a, an ID reminder. It's an ID uh, bracelet you can take with you. They're, they'll be given to you on the way out. And on them is written these seven things. Just as a reminder to help you. It reminds you that you were chosen. God picked you. Just like kickball back in elementary school when you wanted to be picked first. He picked you. He didn't have to, but he did. He picked you. Doesn't matter what anybody else thinks about you. Doesn't matter what you think about you. He picked you. Reminds you that you're redeemed, you're forgiven. Not only has he picked you, but he wiped your slate clean. He forgave everything, all your dirt, it's gone. You've got a clean slate. You've got a clear record in addition to him picking you. You're rich. The text there tells us that he has lavished riches on you. Like you couldn't be any richer than you are today. Whether you realize that or not, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, if you've asked Jesus Christ to be the leader of your life and to forgive your sins, you couldn't get richer. Like for all eternity, you couldn't get richer. He did that for you. You're a masterpiece. Well, what's a masterpiece? What do you do with a masterpiece, right? If it's a masterpiece of art, you, you put it in your gallery, right? It goes in an art gallery, right? That's where a masterpiece goes. Maybe it hangs in the dining room or in the li living room. But, you know, this is, you're not a practice piece of art. You're a masterpiece of art. Not only did he pick you, but he's making you a masterpiece. Not to be thrown away, but that's how he wants to use you. You're his child. You were fatherless. He adopted you as his kid. He adopted you as his kid. He wanted you as his kid. And then not only that, but he made you an heir. And that text tells us that you're actually a co-heir with Jesus Christ. He took you and he made you biological. Even though he adopted you, he gave you all the rights of a biological child. That's what he's done for you. That's what he's done for me. How is it so easy that I forget? So go through this week, no matter what other, others say about you, no matter what in your mind you say about you, let's remember what he says about you. Let's pray. God, this is all about you, and it's about your amazing love for all of us and what you've done for us. We don't deserve it. Father, we don't deserve it, and we're just so grateful. I just pray that as I walk through this week, when I'm tempted to be a part of image management and make myself look good. And um, that I'd remember that doesn't matter. What matters is you. And that um, just in all um, that I do this week and all of us do this week, uh, we just focus on you. You're an awesome God. You're an incredible God. 
And uh, we don't deserve it. And we're just so grateful. Thanks for putting up with us. Amen.